Well, as the title suggests, I'm going to be epoxy bedding this Springfield Armory M1A Standard Walnut. I want to show you that it's a very simple job. Simple is not what you've heard, and that's not what you've been led to believe. I'm going to ask you the question that my science teacher would have asked. It's a philosophical question. Quid est propositum? What is your goal? If you're on the way to work and suddenly a gas light comes on, you got to stop and get gas. That was not your goal that morning. Your goal is to get to work. Getting gas was a necessary inconvenience that you had to put up with. In the real world of military grade gun manufacture of the era that this rifle started out, it was the same as with the Garand and the same as with the 1903 Springfield. The motto of the day was to get the gun out the door. You know, fill the hands of the troops so that they could have them for battle. Especially during World War II, you know, they were grinding out guns by the, by the thousands and thousands. They didn't have time to sit meticulously at a workbench like they were a Parazzi shotgun gunsmith, you know, with, with fine files and carbon paper and black ink and all the things that are necessary to meticulously inlet this stock so that the metal and the wood become one. Tolerance was the name of the game. Tolerance has been until, until CNC machinery came on the scene within the last few decades. Tolerance was something which was always first and foremost with any parts that had to come together. They didn't want to be stalled out by all of a sudden having the, the, the production line come to a halt because receivers and stocks were so tight that somebody had to start chiseling and filing away. They wanted to be able to just slap these guns together and get them, get them down the line. So tolerances were something which were established in order to make sure that there were no headaches in that regard, and no slowdowns, you know, no traffic jams. So there are, there are some tolerances with regard to this action in the stock. We can take care of those tolerances, but without having to butcher this stock. I think there's this unfortunate notion, and it's been, it, it's been fostered and, you know, stoked and, you know, ad nauseum about walnut stock somehow having weakness, that they're somehow unstable. Let me tell you something. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's a bunch of trash. Walnut stocks are and have been for hundreds of years the select walnut, the select wood that is chosen by gun manufacturers for its very stability. It has many other very, very fine qualities. It's extremely hard. It doesn't compress. Uh, it's, it, it resists any squeezing, mechanical squeezing. It cannot be, it, you, cannot, you cannot squeeze it down any thinner than it already is. Um, and it machines beautifully. Uh, it machines like it was steel or aluminum. I mean, you can, you can carve this out with, with power tools or with hand tools, and uh, it, it'll, take, it'll take beautiful uh, inletting. And it's also quite uh, dense and uh, water resistant, you know, without, without too much difficulty, you know, a, a simple application of uh, linseed oil will provide beautiful uh, rot resistance. And uh, you know, it was such a stable wood that at one time in American history, walnut was used for railroad ties, believe it or not. You know, when there was such an abundance of wood in the, in the early days of our railroads, they were actually using walnut in some areas uh, for railroad ties because it was so very hard and dense and it resisted rot and decay. So walnut is very, very stable. Um, what you have with regard to the tolerances of that receiver to the stock is probably less than a 64th of an inch altogether. Now that's sufficient to cause inaccuracy with any rifle. A 64th of an inch, even a couple of thousandths of an inch of side-to-side -side slop is enough to cause some 
degree of inaccuracy downrange because basically the, the receiver jumps from one side of the stock to the other during cycling and during firing and it causes that stock to take a different position on the, on the receiver. Basically it's like having a different cheek weld each time when you shoot. So the rifle just won't shoot in the same spot. Remember that these are four MOA rifles. That was the, that was the required tolerance for military rifles. It's certainly not the sort of tolerance that most people regard as being an accurate uh, tolerance these days. Now I've got a rifle here. This has got, this is my, you've seen this before, this is my Model 70 Winchester Featherweight 257 Roberts and this is a sub MOA gun all the time. A sub MOA gun. This walnut stock is very very slender. There's hardly any wood. There's hardly any wood to this stock. There's there's nothing up front. It's it's. I mean the outside dimension is thin, but inside it's actually it's got it's got a big channel hogged out inside, which makes it very very thin even in its own bulk. And the side of these the the side of these rails here beside the receiver, are much much thinner than on this uh, M1A. Everything about this stock is extremely thin, and this is walnut. It's the same kind of walnut. It's American walnut. It's not the walnut which is the problem. And you don't have to take away walnut and replace it with something else. You don't have to take walnut out and replace it with arrow shafts. You don't have to take walnut out and replace it with aluminum or titanium or anything else. And certainly is not going to help by taking walnut out and replacing it with gobs of epoxy. The, the epoxy properly oriented in your, in your understanding, the epoxy is only to be the shim that's necessary to fill that void where tolerance is left a gap. That's all it is. It's just simply a shim. Now, epoxy needs to be, it has to have a, a particular thickness in order to, you know, stay there. When I say a thickness, I'm talking about a, the, the thickness of a piece of paper, maybe one and a half thicknesses of a sheet of uh, standard 20 pound paper that you put in your printer. That's all that's necessary. You don't have to, you don't have to have thick, you know, quarter inch, three eighths inch thick slabs of uh, epoxy in order to get the job done. Its only job is to fill those voids. That's all it is. When I glass bed, you know, bolt action rifles, very frequently, all that's necessary is to simply provide a, a, a solid surface for the epoxy to adhere. That means to take out with my Dremel tool, to take out a slight amount of wood, simply to uh, undercut the wood a little bit, that the epoxy has a good foothold. And the epoxy is simply uh, applied inside, the receiver is dropped in place, and you know, with necessary protections, you know, so that so that it can be released afterwards, it's just it comes out, and all the voids that used to be there are no longer there. That's the only that's the only goal. Don't get complicated about glass bedding a gun. You know, taking away taking away all kinds of you know metal and taking away all kinds of wood and everything. That is that this this is silly thing to do. You're ruining your gun. You're defacing a gun which has been essentially built properly to begin with, but simply has tolerances that have to be uh, filled in. That's all that's necessary. So I'll show you how that's done. I'll show you how simple it is, and I'll show you that it does. it's not going to require uh, huge amounts of uh, epoxy. Um, this is this rifle here with match grade ammo. You, you perhaps saw it in one of my recent videos, but with match grade ammo, this rifle is quite accurate. Uh, it can be a little bit more accurate. I'm going to, in another video, I'll, I'll install some shims in this uh, gas system here so you can see where that can be tightened up. But other than that, this, this rifle has the capacity to be quite accurate. So let's step over the bench and 
get going, we'll show you what we need to do. The materials that you need to complete this chore will be a suitable uh, epoxy. I'm using the uh, Brownells Aquaglass this time. Now you've seen me use uh, DevCon epoxy, but one of the things that I enjoy about the uh, Aquaglass, not only is it not only is it a good compound, it's proven for rifles, but uh, it comes with uh, it comes with dyes. It comes with black dye and uh, brown dye. So it's it's just uh, it's it's common sense to uh, dye my product with uh, a dye that won't uh, deface the gun, rather than having black or white or anything like that that won't look uh, good. So we got the aqua glass and a stick to uh, mix it with. It's a good idea to uh, have yourself a small cup that you can, a uh, disposable cup that you can work with to uh, mix it in rather, because you're not going to be mixing up much. I don't want you to think that you have to mix up massive quantities of uh, aqua glass. We're going to be dealing with very small amounts. You need to have some uh, black electrical tape Good stretchy stuff, you know. This is get the get the good stuff, you know, 3M or something equivalent to that. You'll need a uh, piece of 3/8 inch dowel, hardwood dowel, and some. Uh, hope I have enough tape here. Shouldn't have to have much tape, but there's uh, some painter's tape. You need to have that, and uh, some artist knives. These are really these are really good to have. They're springy. They allow you to work with uh, the epoxy and get it into places where uh, you, you don't want to work with larger implements. You can get these at any art store. And uh, some sort of a brush that's suitable for applying Kiwi shoe polish. Now I've used uh, all kinds of release agents, spray on release agents. I've used Kiwi. I've used a uh, release agent that comes from Brownells and Kiwi works as good as any of them. Uh, it's just, it basically breaks, you're only trying to break the bond that would occur between the uh, steel and uh, the epoxy. That's all, just breaking the bond. And uh, a good pair of pliers with, it, it has, has to have good sharp pincers at the end because you need to pull out uh, the pin on your uh, rifle in order to get that uh, the cross pin and also for this job the way that I'll be doing it uh, use some uh, JB quick weld or Devcon uh, 5 mini epoxy they're both the same you want to have something that sets up very quickly that you can work with within uh, within a half hour so that you don't uh, have stall time and you're going to be removing this so this is just a temporary application and some plum plumber's putty Plumber's putty. You can use uh, modeling clay. Uh, anything that anything that will fill in holes that can be removed afterwards. But plumber's putty is as good as anything else. Now let's take a tour of the engineering of this uh, stock and see what the contact surfaces are. See what needs to be improved upon and what is uh, already perfectly good. Well, on your stock reinforcement right here, this uh, steel reinforcement inside your stock well, your recoil lug surfaces, that is this surface right here, this back recoil lug surface, that contacts, that steel contacts the steel on that stock reinforcement. That's your that's your recoil lug surface. And if you can see that, get it toward the light, shine a light on it, you'll see that that is actually, it's got impressions where that steel has married with the uh, receiver from just a few times that I have fired this rifle. This rifle has fired perhaps uh, maybe 300 or 400 rounds, that's all. But in that amount of time, the, marry, uh, the marrying of parts has already occurred. 
This stock reinforcement has compressed under the recoil of this recoil surface here and they're fully mated. There's absolutely no reason why we need to alter that relationship. That's, that's been accomplished. On the top surface of this stock right here, you can see this, this top flat portion right here. This has also shown, you can see this little bit of a shine right here. That's where that wood has, that's where that wood has had firm contact with the receiver. That's an accomplished process. That doesn't have to be altered. You don't have to remove this in order to replace it with something that is of no greater density than this. This is never going to compress any more than that. So we're not going to be taking any wood out of that. So we've got the two primary, the recoil surface right here and this large receiver uh, mating surface right here. That's, you can see, in fact, that that is uniform all the way around. It's, it's, got a, it's got a perfect uniform contact surface. So that, you don't want to mess with that in the least. The rest of the receiver, you can see these thin rails right here. These thin rails provide the lateral, that is, in other words, this support from side to side as well as the sides of the recoil lug. Those are the areas that are loose, and that's the area we need to address. We don't need to address this rail right here. This is, this is already bottoming perfectly flat. So what do we need to accomplish? We need to accomplish simply the looseness that occurs between this, and I'll show you what I mean. Rearward, it's tight as a drum. This way, it's tight as a drum. It can't get any tighter than that. The looseness occurs right here, wiggling it side to side. In other words, I can physically move the receiver laterally. That's the only element that we need to correct. We don't need to be adding all kinds of ugly compound down here, which is going to destroy this beautiful stock and make it to something which it was never designed to be. So we're going to leave alone all the wood. The only thing we're going to do is we're going to roughen this surface up here on each side with the Dremel tool, both sides. I'm just going to simply uh, make a few small holes that the uh, epoxy can adhere to so it doesn't uh, slip and slide. And it shouldn't really because it's captured in there. We don't have to take out this stock reinforcement, the stock reinforcement is doing its job. The wood provides the, the lateral support side to side, so we're simply going to put some epoxy in this channel right here, down in through this side here, and along this side here. That's all we're going to do. We're not going to be, we're not going to be hogging out massive quantities of wood and destroying this fine piece of furniture. So, and that's it. And as far as the, uh, the front side goes, one of the things you can do with acro glass, as a matter of fact, is you can, you can, uh, you know, you can put some in there to provide some uh, resistance to uh, burning and scorching. That's one of the things you can do, but we're not going to do that today. We're simply going to take care of that tolerance issue. The only mechanical detail we have to take care of besides taking the uh, gun down to this point right here is to remove this pin you can see your you can see the coupling pin right here you need to remove the roll pin that goes into the top of it and with a good pair of pliers that have good sharp ends on it and don't lose that because that's not a that's not an easy piece of uh, hardware to find just grasp it firmly and pull straight to the rear. It should pop right out. Again, find a safe place for that. I'm going to put it in my parts basket. And likewise with the uh, coupling pin, I'm going to put that in the parts basket where it won't get misplaced. That's all we need to remove. Now we have to be very careful of guarding ourselves against uh, 
a catastrophic situation. And that would be to uh, permanently cement this action into the stock. You don't want to do that, and there's no reason to concern yourself about doing that. There's no, there's no uh, real issues to take care of other than this simple hook right here, and to fill in these to fill in these holes. We shouldn't be getting epoxy fire out into this area anyway. This is totally unnecessary. The, 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 this receiver has got massive amounts of support on the back of it right here. This is where it lays flat on the top of the stock. And this is your recoil surface again. And so we're just going to be applying epoxy to where these surfaces contact right here. Nothing back here. So we'll take some plumber's putty. This is dried out a little bit, but sometimes if you tip the tub upside down, you'll find uh, you'll find that you can get a nice, sufficiently uh, wet piece out. You can add a little bit of uh, mineral mineral oil to that to uh, soften it up, also. Um, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Anytime plumber's putty gets hard, you can just add a little bit of mineral oil to it and knead it. There's a little piece of like a little piece of bread dough. The warmth of your hands will also uh, make that much uh, softer. That's livening up nicely. So you want a nice smooth consistency so that it will find its way into the holes. There aren't too many to deal with actually. There we go, just a drop of, you can see how that cleaned up nicely, it's no longer hard. And uh, so I'm going to first of all apply that into the uh, coupling pin hole right here and get that, just press it right into place. You won't need much. Just to fill it in flush, that's all we're going to do. The same thing. On the top section right here, we'll fill that. We'll fill that void in. And uh, just wipe it off flush. Your, the main thing to avoid is any places where hooks can be made, where something can wrap, where epoxy can wrap itself around in a hook where you can't uh, be removed. These are such small. These are such small surfaces that actually, even if uh, epoxy were to get in them, uh, they'll shear off by simple force by uh, just a quick, a quick thrust, and that will that will shear right off. The ones that we really have to contend with are these larger surfaces right here. So these two uh, these two notches in the recoil lug, we need to fill those up, and that's what they have the. Uh, dowel for. Now this is 3 8 inch dowel. It's probably a little bit too big for that particular purpose, but uh, what I want to do is get that get that cut flush on each side so that uh, it doesn't provide any hooks and I can I can work that right in nice and tightly. Uh, probably that's that's a birch dowel. I have a feeling I can tap that into place with a hammer. If it was a sixteenth of an inch smaller, it would be even better, but uh, I can get that in there, I think. Perfect. So we've got that dowel in place, and that will fill up the lion's share of that slot. Just tap it in. You can see how that has filled filled in nicely all around there. And uh, the same with this side here. I'll give this a 
good smack. Get that in solidly tight. There we go. Now I need to cut that. I need to cut that off. Just a few strokes of a uh, very fine hacksaw blade. We'll trim that off. Try not to make any squeaky sounds, which means that you're cutting metal. You don't want to deface your gun. There we go. It's coming off. There we go. And no scars whatsoever to the metal. That's all I was using. Very, very fine. There's no, uh, there's no teeth on there that you don't want to have anything or cut into the side of that steel. I'll trim that off with a uh, fine chisel, working toward the rear, to, I should say toward the front of the gun because you don't want to pop this out and ruin your, ruin your fine work. So I'm just trimming this flush. Flush is the most important thing of all because that provides a smooth surface where there's no uh, grabs for the wood to uh, catch, either top or bottom. Take your time with this because this is, uh, this is important to uh, ensure that you don't have any uh, problems removing your stock later. It's cutting nicely against that end grain. Just work straight down without, destro without destroying my chisel edge. That's sufficient. And check the other side here, that is flush. Okay, so we've got that done. Now if you look right here, these recesses, top and bottom, are the reason for the uh, quick setting epoxy. We're going to apply some quick setting epoxy in there, but before we do that we'll put some uh, wax, some uh, shoe polish, and that will provide for an easy release of that when it's done. Now not only do these ends have to be flush, and ensure it with your fingers. Your fingers are the best gauge. If you feel any, if you feel any protrusions, uh, shave them off with your chisel and make sure that there's nothing there. Next is to make sure that this back surface is flush before we put any epoxy in there. Use a straight edge and see if there's any protrusion of that dowel. If you feel any protrusion of that dowel, that has to be removed. It's actually quite flush. I'm, my steel is on steel there, so that is that's completely flush, and there's no there's no protrusions that will hook around. It's time to attend to this section right here. You don't have to remove this. This is totally unnecessary to remove because that's it's a pain. That's a pain to get that pin out. It's in a recessed area. Uh, to get it back in and out is, is difficult, and it's another thing that you can lose. All you need to do is, all you have to do is fill that up with some putty or something like that, where it won't, where epoxy won't get in there. Epoxy, remember, is gonna, that's gonna be a mirror image of everything you do here. So, uh, neatness is, neatness is important. We're basically going to be building epoxy in the wood on the sides here and on the sides of these two these two rails. And uh, now we'll take some epoxy and also I mean some putty and also put it into that hole right there. Here we go. Now inspect everything very, very carefully. Uh, this is the only time you get to uh, inspect and make sure that you have all your surfaces uh, adequately protected from any hooks. So now we're just going to put the uh, we're going to put the quick setting epoxy in this side right here. Now JB Quick 
and DEVCON five minute epoxy are both the same proposition there 50 50 so just simply apply a small amount of the hardener onto the warrior surface and uh, don't get these caps mixed up whatever you do and the epoxy on another dot visually the same quantities as sufficient so we mix these two ingredients up thoroughly give them a good uh, give them a good uh, minute of working time make sure you don't have any uh, bi colors should all be mixed up uniform gray color Mix, mix even what you have on your stick. Wipe that off, and uh, this this stick has been around for a good long time. I've you take your kiwi wax. You can also use uh, Johnson uh, furniture wax, butcher's wax, anything, anything that's. Uh, but this is cheaper because it's just a small quantity is all you need. So apply this generously to your dowel. And uh, to that, to that surface right there, back and front, we want to be able to remove this afterwards. This is not our glass bedding job. This is all this is doing is just providing a, a slippery surface for the glass bedding so that it shears by here. And that's all we're doing. So that's it. I've got my epoxy ready to go. And apply that right to these little grooves right there, both sides. Just to flush it up. Now this is your recoil surface, so you don't want to have uh, you don't want to have a uh, mess there. This is this is your recoil lug surface, so you want to make sure it's nice and flush, nice and flat. We can trim that down before we go to put the uh, glass bedding compound in. Just smooth it off so that you uh, have those flush surfaces just like that you know small amounts will actually shear off so you don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about small degrees of uh, hooks those are the epoxy wall is green in the first uh, couple of days that that will shear off like crazy so it doesn't uh, it doesn't turn super hard right away so we've got that set and ready to go it's a uh, five minute epoxy but we'll give it a good half hour. Now I've actually given this about uh, oh an hour and a half of good setting time while I had dinner and uh, as you can see I've trimmed up all the glass that uh, may have been on the back surfaces this recoil lug surface right here and on on both on both sides also paying close attention to this surface on this side making sure that this is flush and that I've got no epoxy on there. Just clean it up really carefully and uh, check all your surfaces and if, if you see any, uh, this is just wax, that's, that's no problem at all, but if you see any glass you want to remove that and uh, any epoxy you want to remove that and just make sure that this rear surface is nice and flush. It's critically important to remember one of the most, uh, I would say, the biggest mistake that people make with uh, glass bedding is they alter original reference points. Never, ever, ever alter original reference points on the rifle. You have key reference points on this rifle. There's actually really only 
two surfaces. This rear surface is a critical reference point. This is your recoil lug. That has to remain intact and that has to be steel on steel, the same, the same contact that it had before with the uh, stock reinforcement. So preserve this at all costs. Don't, don't add epoxy in between this because adding epoxy uh, is going to be a fragile surface. No matter what you do, uh, epoxy will not adhere to steel uh, that well. It will break apart like glass. So you want to avoid of adding any material in here. If some happens to if some happens to weasel its way in because there's a flaw in the steel, that's fine, but that's not altering the dimension. The other dimension is this plane here. I'll bring the camera back a little bit. This plane right here. This this entire this entire flat surface is the vertical reference point. This is the this is the rear reference point and this is the vertical reference point that holds that receiver down flush against the stock. Never do anything that alters any part of that height. I'll show you what I mean. This is where some this is where I see some real serious errors are being made. When you have when you have the rifle sitting in its natural position, you'll notice that this, this surface, the steel of the receiver all along, that is supposed to butt against this wood. Do not, under any circumstances, add tape underneath this at any point which would elevate that surface and cause this to be spongy back here. You're just going to have, you're just going to create a, a bigger problem than you had from, from the beginning. This vertical reference point is absolutely rock solid. There's nothing, there's nothing wiggling about that vertical plane. What you, what you're only seeking to do is to eliminate the wiggle that is lateral, side to side. So keep that in mind, bear that in mind at all times that you're, you're limiting your, you're limiting your scope of glass bedding to just this surface right here on this side and this surface on here on this side. Those are the only two surfaces that are necessary. Why in the world people hog out big chunks of wood and then reposition the, the gun into the stock uh, sitting in basically in a feather bed that doesn't have any reference point? I have no, no idea whatsoever because all they're doing is creating, they're creating torsion stresses up in front end and all sorts of things that are going to create problems. This rifle as it is, with match grade ammo at 100 yards uh, on, a, on a pretty breezy day, I shot uh, a 2.15, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a 2.15 10-shot group. That's, that's 2 MOA. That's a solid 2 MOA gun. This is not an inaccurate rifle. This is a standard barrel. This is not a heavy barrel. There's no, there's no undue influence up the front end. If there were, uh, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a nice round group the way it was. There's no, there's no flyers. Everything about the rifle is fine. This will, this will reduce and eliminate by glass bedding uh, at these junction points at this, side, at this side plane on both sides. That's going to eliminate all the errors that are induced by uh, that, that wiggle. So those mating surfaces are very simply found along this, along this side right here. We don't have to go all the way up forward here. This is, this is really not necessary. This is, just a, this is just a clearance area. You don't have to bed those areas. Just simply, we're just bedding along this surface here and along this surface over here. And you don't, like I say, it's, this is just to eliminate wobble. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to remanufacture the entire bedding. The rifle is bedded. It's a little bit of a. It's a little bit of a misnomer to say that we're glass bedding the rifle. We're really not bedding it. The, the rifle has been bedded. All we're doing is eliminating any uh, tolerances that were induced by manufacturing. That's all we're doing. Now this is not free hand work. You want to have some support to work with, and uh, start by having a good mechanics or machinist vice. This is a mechanics vice. Machinist vice is a lot more precise than this, but this is fine for uh, doing gunsmithing. Pad it up nicely. This is two layers of uh, thick cotton. It's an old diaper actually. And uh, put the parallel surfaces of your stock inside there and bring it up just snug enough to hold the stock firm. 
as you can see, I, I can apply, I can apply vertical pressure to the stock and it's going to stay put. I'm only going to be using this to uh, support the surface as I use the Dremel tool. Now you can do this work with small hand carving gouges or uh, small Swiss files or whatever, but this is my uh, tool of choice. I've been using this for many years. This is probably, I'm sure this Dremel tool is older than many of my viewers. And I've been using the same cutting bit for many years. I believe this is only a uh, eighth inch or maybe a three thirty second ball bit. And um, I always run it at high speed when you're doing this work because at low speed it'll tend to walk on you and make and make problems. Um, hang on to this with both hands and watch out for this. This, as you can see, I've I've scuffed this up on other projects, certainly not gun stocks, but this is this has come in contact with other things and the chuck will damage your wood. So keep consciously aware of where that is all the time. Keep your eye on what you're doing and before you pull the trigger, think about what you're what you're cutting out. And this is a good time to have hearing protection on. Uh, run, as I say, run this at top RPM. And uh, this is 30,000 RPM, but that'll keep it from walking away from me. I'm only cutting this vertical surface on the side here. And I'm only, I'm staying below, staying absolutely below this by a good eighth of an inch. You don't want to get up into this wood here. This is this is uh, all finished wood that's visible from the outside. We're not attempting to undercut much. All we're doing is creating a platform, a surface that the uh, epoxy will adhere to. And it doesn't have to come all the way up to the very top. It's going to eliminate all play if even if it comes up two thirds of the way. So whether we get epoxy gushing up over the top, we really want to avoid that because that makes a mess and it, it creates an unsightly thing that doesn't do a thing for the accuracy. So anyway, I'll continue along and uh, you can watch. for that truck. I'm just making a Z pattern all the way back. I'm going about half the depth of that ball. I'll work along the top of the stock right here. Now I'm I'm coming up close to this, so watch out for that chuck. Now I'm going to work down along the uh, recoil lug surface. Just going to... Square pattern. Don't touch the seal. Stay away from the uh, stock reinforcement. That is sufficient. I'll bring you in so you can see that. Now check that out. That's, that's being very conservative. It's not important to be aggressive with this. We're not trying to install a lot of glass that replaces wood. We're just using glass, the epoxy, to uh, basically to fill in and to shim uh, any, any voids in the wood. So that's what this is going to do. Notice that we didn't come up I, I stayed a good 3 sixteenths of an inch below this top surface here and I didn't, I didn't gouge out all the wood, I just created a, a good bedding surface for that epoxy and the same here I went, I stayed away from the steel and just uh, went in half the depth of that ball and just made three passes around, that's all I did. And as you notice I didn't come into this recess right here, this is where your, this is where your cross link pin goes uh, to hold your, your main spring in, your, the spring for your uh, operating rod. So that, that pin basically works within that, within that space. And there's no reason to reinforce that part of the stock, uh, the uh, receiver up there. There's going to be plenty of reinforcement all along here. There's, there's far more reinforcement in this area right here than you'll find in most bolt action rifles.
something about the smell of walnut being cut. I love it. I think the, the greatest problem that people have with glass bedding is they're very overly aggressive. Glass bedding is a, a discrete process. If you look at um, if you look at the glass bedding that uh, is done on the super accurate uh, FN produced uh, Model 70 Winchesters, you'll see that they they used there's probably less than a, there's probably less than two teaspoons of epoxy used in that entire bedding system, and that's only to support uh, where the uh, rear and the front uh, stock screws are. That's all. And in this case here, all we're doing is we're there's no there's no problem whatsoever with the with this top surface. That's fine. It's sitting exactly where it needs to. All we're going to do is correct that wobble back and forth. That's it. Here's another key reference point. Note this handguard is sitting squarely on top of this stock. That too is a vertical reference point. You don't want to disturb that, so leave the hand guard on. That hand guard will provide a good reference point, and it will it will provide a solid a solid surface to prevent this receiver from sinking down unnaturally. You don't want this receiver to start doing something that it's not supposed to do in real life. You don't want to do something on the bench that it doesn't replicate when the rifle's all together. So leave your leave your hand guard on. You're not going to be getting anywhere near that handguard with any epoxy. Uh, the, old, the old stuff, they still make it. The regular, regular aqua glass is good for uh, coating surfaces especially, like if you want to coat the inside of the uh, barrel channel. Um, but this is, uh, you can kind of paint it on. But this here uh, doesn't flow. Uh, it, it, it stays put where you, where you uh, apply it. So I like to use the uh, Acro glass gel, and I and again I've used Devcon epoxy. You know the industrial stuff that's fifty something dollars a uh, for for one container that it'll do it'll do twenty or thirty guns. I've used it to uh, even repair bird bath outside. Um, it's it's great stuff, but it's expensive. Uh, you can also use JB Weld or its equivalent. Devcon equivalent. Uh, this is this is the permanent epoxy. This is not the five minute stuff. Uh, but the JB Weld that also works. I just wanted to have something that was neutral color that I could color with. Uh, basically, the the aqua glass gel is a uh, is a is a non colored uh, substance that can be readily colored with the dye, and that's that's why I like using it for this type of project. So let's go about getting this waxed up and uh, just using a brush apply that to all surfaces where glass is like uh, where epoxy is likely to uh, come in contact one of the nice things about um, the Garand style action is uh, that it's when you're glass bedding it it's extremely easy to see what you're doing because uh, you have access unlike a bolt action rifle that's close uh, once you drop the uh, action into the stock. Uh, this is, uh, you can hear Benny over there, He's, he probably wants to go out. He heard, uh, he heard duck hunters out uh, nearby this morning and uh, they were, they were, uh, they must have run into an awful lot of ducks because we heard uh, from the house here, we heard probably two or three hundred shots over a period of just about an hour or so during uh, early sunrise. So anyway, I'm applying this wax, even though we're not bedding on the inside. That that might it might creep up. You be a, you can always chip it off of steel uh, that's casually uh, contacted with the uh, epoxy. But it's a lot easier to uh, remove it if if you use this wax. And this wax is totally totally harmless to the gun. And you don't have to worry about. You see. Um, you might see a little balls of uh, wax. Those would be no problem at all. That doesn't that doesn't impart any uh, thickness or surface that uh, is going to inhibit uh, the epoxy flow in what in whatever way possible. It's um, this uh, and go up a little bit on the sides. You don't have to go crazy 
but just uh, go go up against the, the the sides a little bit in case you have any uh, epoxy that works up. You should have none whatsoever back here, but just the same, uh, and it pro provides good sheen and protection to the steel too. So uh, no problem at all. Just kind of buff it on. I like to I like to spend four or five minutes at it just so that the brush is absolutely certain of contacting every spot. Be very careful to uh, take note of putting it on this back this back recoil lug surface and uh, just clean up any excess. It's shoe polish so uh, it, it does it does harden and dry uh, in contact with the air so that's that's really what we want. That should pretty much do it I think. Epoxy will not stick to that. I'll put a little bit up here in front by the barrel just in case some should it, there's any that oozes up there. Again, we're, we're, we're going to work very hard to uh, keep, keep it under control and, and just, just apply it, just apply it along this edge here and along this edge here and uh, leave it at that. So let that dry for about uh, four or five minutes. Now I don't want the uh, rifle stock to sag down into these vice jaws. I don't want to clamp the vice jaws too tightly because if I do, I could possibly crack the stock. Hi, Benny. So I'm just going to take a random block of wood, just a scrap block of wood, and drop it on top of the uh, vise. And uh, I'll take my cloth here. That block of wood should be narrower than the stock itself. And I'm just squeezing gently, just just sufficiently to hold it in place. I don't want to, I don't want to crush this. This is this is very fragile here because there's no support. This is this is a rather, relatively thin walnut. So just position your vice jaws and uh, give them a gentle squeeze without without uh, turning this uh, wood inward. And at the back side, you can see it's resting down on the bench. I've got an absolutely firm support. That can't go anywhere while I'm working. I don't want to have any surprises where that suddenly drops down. Now I'm going to clean the surfaces of wood that we're going to be applying epoxy to with some uh, denatured alcohol. It dries very quickly and it's uh, thorough in cleaning up any oils or wax. I like to use just a uh, chafing dish. Put a small amount in there. And don't use the same brush that you applied wax with, just uh, an old toothbrush will do. And we're just going to clean up those uh, surfaces thoroughly, make sure there's no uh, contaminants that would uh, disturb the uh, adhesion of the epoxy. So we'll work at that, clean those up nicely. I'll apply some uh, painter's tape to this uh, vertical surface here, just for just for protection from overruns. Makes things easier to clean up afterwards. This top surface I'm not applying any tape to because this is where tape could interfere with that vertical plane. We're going to take care of that by using wax and uh, we're just going to place wax along the top here. I took this, clean this surface out before applying the wax because otherwise the alcohol would be removing it from this. So now we're just going to carefully apply wax to this top surface after I i uh, put some painter's tape on the other side and carefully apply some wax just to this top surface here, not to the uh, inner side. You can put it, you can put it on quite liberally because it's, it's uh, going to, that epoxy will flake right off very, very swiftly. It won't adhere to this. And just a little bit up front in case we have any overruns. You can go along the back side here just in case. Just smooth that up with my fingers so that it doesn't uh, get down into the uh, epoxy. Sprays are all right but the only problem with sprays is you know you have a control issue. First of all it's very expensive to purchase sprays and uh, aerosol uh, you know anything that's aerosol is very is, is 10 times the price of uh, non-aerosol stuff. So this does a good job. Uh, it, it goes exactly where you want and it doesn't uh, go where you don't need it.
no matter how many times I've done this, I always take a look at these instructions and make sure that I'm not forgetting something. So always open up this instruction pamphlet. Don't rely on memory and do everything as it's uh, instructed. The uh, setting time for this, uh, the working time for this is a, about less than 20 minutes. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. The uh, you got the you got the gel, and you got the hardener. Do not weigh them. They have to be mixed by volume because they weigh differently. So they must be mixed by volume, just one to one. So use two. Use two sticks or spatulas. Two uh, popsicle sticks are great. Uh, I like to use these because I can clean them off and continue to use them the next time. But use use different ones, and uh, you know you, you, once you get them put together, then you can use one for mixing and applying. But whatever you do, don't don't dip one into the other. So, and here's the uh, brown dye that comes along with the um, mixture. I'll open that up right now with a uh, exacto knife, so I don't have to be rushing about trying to find a cutting instrument. This is very, very, very concentrated. Uh, when you when you use this stuff, uh, use. Use a, use a drop at a time, literally. Uh, it's very, very concentrated. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna violate that seal like that. Put that aside where it's handy. Now again, this goes a long ways. Uh, so we're using the, uh, applying the resin first into our container. Let me move it over so you can see. Just uh, put the resin in. You, there's no rush with this until it's uh, starting to mix up. So be very, be very precise. And uh, use exactly the measurement that they call for. For the sake of consistency, I'll use a full tablespoon of each, just so it's easy to see and measure out. This is supposed to be 60. 68 degrees Fahrenheit where I'm using this. I'm right on the edge. My basement right here is, according to my thermometer, is 67, but uh, I'll turn the heat up once this starts uh, working, and I'll leave the heat on. That's, that's an enormous amount of uh, aqua glass. Never add more hardener. To speed up the process, it's actually it'll, it'll actually slow the process down and prevent hardening. So always uh, be precise, and uh, just exactly 50/50. That's all you want. So now, remember to uh, change instruments. Now, before proceeding, I want to wipe this uh, measuring spoon off very thoroughly. It's a good time to clean off this uh, knife, too. Alcohol will clean that up as well. That'll take off any of that uh, substance. Put your cover back on before you mix them up because if you put the wrong cover on, it'll adhere. And it'll start a chemical reaction that'll harden up everything. So swab that out. It's not necessary to get it all completely out because we're gonna be, we're gonna be applying the uh, hardener to that but um, we'll clean the whole thing up immediately afterwards. Now I'm using a different knife so I don't contaminate it. And the same thing, just one tablespoon. I hate to use that much. By rights, I should have gotten a different, uh, I should have got a uh, 
one and a half teaspoon measure it would have conserved my aqua glass but that's all right we got we have plenty I got enough left to do a couple more rifles the fact that it's a little bit stiff is probably not a bad thing it it's going to uh, control how it flows in the stock you don't want to have it below 68 degrees though however I'm just about at that point right now now this should be mixed this has to be mixed for exactly two minutes do it by the clock that's vital important because uh, you want to make sure you have a good chemical compound you want to have a good mixture without uh, any mistakes and I don't I don't start the clock until I actually start mixing this is gooey stuff so it's a good thing that if you if you want to wear gloves go right ahead I've, I've worked all my life without wearing gloves and I'm not going to start now there we go Set that aside. Don't forget to clean that off afterwards. All right, we're going to start, and do not whip it. This is uh, this is just this is just mixed, gently mixed, without uh, without whipping it. Now I can start timing. I've got uh, see the second hand on my clock over there. This is why you don't want to have it too. Uh, too cold because uh, it won't it won't mix completely. This is mixing fine, but be sure to get all of it and maintain your mixing for two minutes. Watch, make sure you don't have any uh, stripes in your colors there. It's white, white and yellow, so you want to make sure that's all thoroughly incorporated. See, I've been doing that about 45 seconds. Now this uh, cup is starting to get warm. If it gets much warmer than this, I'll probably put the other cup to the outside so that I can handle it. Right now I don't want to do that because uh, it would spin inside. So. Uh, when I start actually working with it, I might do that though. Okay, we're working on our second minute. There we go. We're ready to begin and start applying it. And don't, whatever you do, don't panic with this stuff. Kind of think ahead what you want to do, how your tools work, and uh, apply this. thoroughly. It's a good thing to work it down into that uh, crevice. Remember we're only filling an area which is probably less than uh, paper's thickness on each side. So you don't need to have you don't need to have enormous amount of uh, epoxy in there. Don't worry about it getting down a little bit low down into this area here because uh, you'll have uh, plenty of time to uh, work underneath and clean up any uh, excess. And now we're going to just apply it into this area here, work it in both directions. This is your where your recoil lug goes. Benny's upset about something. You can see how much I've got left here. There's a lot of, a lot of epoxy. So now we're done. We'll set that aside. This is a good idea to uh, clean this off because you're going to likely forget it and that'll get stiff so we get plenty of time to work on this <clears throat> I 
double check, make sure that you've uh, applied your release agent. This is a good time to double check that to be sure that you uh, have done that because otherwise you'll be taking a hatchet to this. And guide it right into place. Don't panic, don't uh, set it, and don't drag it on each side. Just lower it precisely into place like that. And now what I like to do is lift it a couple of times so it can suck into those voids. It'll give you a more complete seal. Now you're probably wondering why I have that um, electrical tape. Electrical tape, you can use, uh, you can use um, surgical tubing. You know, some people use surgical tubing. This is a hell of a lot cheaper than surgical tubing. And uh, it's also very elastic. So I'm tying around. I'm going to go back here. I'm not going to go too far forward. If I go too far forward, I won't be able to work on uh, I won't be able to work on the uh, underside of the rifle, but I'll wrap this around several times tightly and uh, right around where the sight cover is. That's the best place on these rifles. Now I've done several uh, Mini 14s and this is almost identical process. So this is not the first time I've done this type of uh, action before. So, um, and with a wood stock, this is gonna be fabulously uh, different than working with a working with a uh, synthetic stock on a mini 14 much much more uh, secure so that's as tight as I've got I've got a number of wraps around there that's absolutely solid so I'll cut that off and just so just as a uh, trick that any electrician knows, double back that last piece of tape so that you have a tag in to grab hold of to unwind it so you don't lose it. Now we're going to let that, uh, we're going to let that set for a while, but before we do, we'll take the rifle and uh, I can see some of it from above here. We'll take our paddle and just go inside and scrape away any excess. It's very easy to see it. And uh, don't get too don't get too industrious because you don't want to drag it out of the uh, surfaces there. You don't want to suck it out. So just take out the excess with your uh, knife. And I can actually see some underneath. I'll, I'll flip the rifle over and uh, get at the other surfaces. As you can see, this is, um, this is not rocket science and it's not something that uh, is, is at all uh, a big challenge. It's, it's a very simple process. Now that I have that receiver secured back here, I can uh, confidently flip the rifle over without disturbing it. And you can see how you can peer right into that entire uh, action. And that's where you can remove any, you can remove any excess. But like I say, don't dig around because um, you're, only gonna t you're only gonna pull it out of that, uh, those recesses. You wanna just uh, take, Take off excess, that's all. Make sure that your rifle is uh, well supported by the back end here, by the stock. See, I've got, uh, I used, I used less than a third of this. So I probably altogether, I used less than a tea, teaspoon and a half, I would say. Now, whatever you do, just make sure that you uh, get any epoxy that 
may have uh, gotten up into your uh, action area. You don't want to have anything whatsoever where the uh, where the uh, working mechanism is. That's not the purpose here. So there, I got one area that um, I can apply at the front of the uh, stock reinforcement. I can uh, apply a little bit where it didn't go down in. It just dresses it up a little bit, gives a nice clean effect. And I forgot to put on the, uh, I forgot the uh, die. Um, this, those things always happen when you're busy talking. Um, but that's not necessary. I don't have to worry about that. This is uh, strictly, strictly cosmetic and nobody's going to be looking at this inside the gun. So there's not going to be much, uh, there's not going to be much epoxy to view. Uh, once it's, I'm just filling in the uh, crevice between the wood and uh, rifle steel, and wherever that, wherever I can see a crevice appear, I'm going to be reaching the end of my working time very quickly. This is uh, this is going to this is going to start coming together probably in the next uh, five minutes or so. So I got to work right along. Put it on and then use your, your straight edge, this sharp edge here, to uh, scrape off any excess because uh, the, more you, the more you get off now, uh, the less work you're going to have later on cleaning it up. Now don't forget to clean up your tools before you get too far along. That'll start setting up very quickly now. I have both of my knives, and in a second we'll peer into that stock and see what it's doing. I love working on this uh, style rifle because, as I say, you uh, have the great advantage of being able to see what's going on uh, right where it's right where it's taking place. Whereas with a bolt action rifle, you uh, you don't have that you don't have that advantage. So we'll clean this up off my. Uh, measuring cup. I've always got to, I got to remember to get another uh, measuring cup, measuring uh, spoon so I can have one on hand. Two teaspoons would be better for 90 percent of the work that you do rather than two tablespoons. Naturally they they don't mind if you use more than you need but uh, I've got, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of epoxy. I could do, I could do three uh, M1As with what I mixed up, so that's more than sufficient. Now that's what the work looks like on the inside. As you can see, I I did add some uh, epoxy to this crevice right here that exists between the stock reinforcement and the and the stock itself. That'll provide some stability and crack resistance to where that. Uh, now that's that means that this. The stock reinforcement is uh, not going to come out that easily, but I have no reason to get it out. And when I do need to get it out, it will squeeze. It will squeeze in this direction and pop loose. So it, it's not a permanent. It's not a permanently installed piece. There's nothing in behind it. So as you can see, it's nicely. It's nicely uh, epoxied. But it's not up into the action. We want to make sure we didn't get any up into the action. And make sure that you don't have any running into the uh, into the receiver, you know, into the uh, upper section of the receiver right here that would interfere with uh, your bolt lugs. There's some there's some wax up there. That's fine. That wax is that wax is perfectly okay. But uh, just make sure that you don't have any epoxy that got up and uh, get into your action. Clean that out with alcohol on a toothbrush before you go far. But be very careful. You don't get be careful with alcohol because it'll get down into that epoxy and it will dilute it. What do you want to do now, Benny? Probably getting bored, huh? Well, there you go. I'm quite willing to bet that that's not nearly as scary a process as you thought it was going to be. 
I'm going to take this rifle up into a uh, heated environment now and uh, let it sit where it's nice and warm. You can apply, you can, you can put a heat lamp, you know, 18 or 24 inches or so away from the uh, stock if you need to speed it up for any reason. Make sure you keep your uh, cup of epoxy on here and that's your gauge to tell when uh, things are setting up. In about nine hours or so, you can keep an eye on it, but in about nine hours or so, you can go back at it with uh, judiciously taking away any excess uh, that might be on metal surfaces that you don't want to have, that you don't want to have there. It'll clean up very nicely. Um, vinegar can be used to uh, clean up as well as alcohol too. The only thing is, do not use vinegar on blued steel. Blued steel will react to vinegar and will blotch it. It's very bad, so don't get vinegar next to steel. But uh, alcohol will work fine at this at this stage. Just don't let it dribble into your epoxy. Um, if if you did it right, you shouldn't have any excess to clean up. There should be nothing oozing out the top surfaces, and no ugly no ugly uh, mess. Um, the uh, process is really easy to do with a with a uh, Garand style uh, rifle whether it's a M1A, M14 or a Mini 14 very very simple because you have complete access to the uh, workings underneath. So now uh, we're going to just let this sit around uh, in a heated environment and uh, let it warm up and in nine eight or nine hours I'll start checking that and make sure I can uh, clean off any excess um, and then uh, give it about, give it a, at least a good 12 to 24 hours. I like to give it about uh, 12 hours uh, and then I'll, I'll perhaps crack the uh, action. Usually I don't. Usually I let it go until the full 24 hours of cure. And um, after I break the action free tomorrow, uh, then I'll put it back together and don't use it for at least two and a half to three days because they're, they're, it's still going to be green. You don't want to apply any uh, recoil to it until it's uh, completely set up and in good shape. So check everything out. Make sure you don't have any gobs of it down inside your uh, inside your bore or anything like that. Uh, any any surprises? That should do it. So to all my Patreon donors who have helped me purchase things such as the uh, Acro Glass. Uh, and to, for all the support that you've given me, I really appreciate that's uh, that's something that's uh, so vitally important to me. Benny thanks you. He's uh, anxious to get out and do some uh, walking around in this nice fall day. Maybe I'll grab my shotgun and we'll go do a little bit of uh, partridge hunting. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. God bless.